emotion and time spent searching our conscience for what is right. Some of us have to face situations that can't be corrected. Our actions may have left permanent physical or emotional scars or even caused someone's death. We must somehow learn to live with such things. We live with indescribable remorse over such acts and wonder what we could possibly do to make amends. This is where we have no choice but to rely on our higher power. We may have difficulty in forgiving ourselves, but we can ask for the forgiveness of a loving God. We sit down, become quiet in the presence of our higher power, and ask for guidance in what we should do. Many of us have found answers in dedicating our lives to helping other addicts and other forms of service to humanity. There are no easy answers for problems like these. We simply do the very best we can, relying on our sponsor and the God of our understanding for guidance. For many of us, the wreckage of our past includes such relatively minor things as outstanding arrest warrants for traffic violations, while others have committed crimes entailing very serious consequences. We may find ourselves in a dilemma over such issues. If we turn ourselves into the authorities, we may go to jail. If we don't, we may live in fear of being caught and sent to jail anyway. With the help of our sponsor and the God of our understanding, we are willing to do whatever it takes to maintain our recovery. We may also have to rely on legal advice before making such amends. Consulting a lawyer about these problems can be of great benefit. 41. Especially troublesome financial amends may also require professional advice. Many of us have amassed debts at an alarming rate. We may owe financial amends that are beyond our means to pay in the foreseeable future. Some of us may owe bills that amount to more than we can conceivably earn in the next several years. Some of us rarely paid our rent, utility bills, or phone bills. We may have found it easier to uproot our lives and move rather than meet our financial obligations. Just as we do for all of our amends, we discuss our financial amends with our sponsor first. Some of us have begun providing for our families since we've been in recovery, they are dependent on us for their food and shelter. We usually find that we have to budget our money very carefully in order to meet our current living expenses while paying as much as possible on our old debts. We may resolve such situations by contacting our creditors, explaining our situation, and expressing our desire to settle our debts. We agree on a reasonable plan for paying off our debts, and we stick to it. This is an example of how living our amends is a process rather than a, once and for all, occurrence. It takes great discipline, personal sacrifice, and commitment to continue to pay a bill for years and years, but we can regain our self-respect only by following through. Most of us find making amends for the damage we did in intimate relationships to be extremely uncomfortable. As we rode our fourth step, we realized that we not only robbed ourselves of the chance for meaningful relationships, we also caused deep emotional wounds in our partners. Our fears of intimacy or commitment may have led us to use, be unfaithful to, or abandon the people who loved us. We were generally unavailable to those people. While there are times when we need to approach such people with our amends, there are other times when it is best to leave them alone so as not to reopen old wounds. Knowing the difference requires complete honesty on our part and open communication with our sponsor. 
Whether or not we make direct amends to the people we've harmed in relationships, we definitely need to change the way we behave in our relationships today. If we ran from intimacy before, we need to sit down and learn to communicate with our partners. We must become more considerate, sensitive, and attentive to the needs of others. Sometimes, the only way we can make amends is to change the way we live. As discussed in the 8th step, we may owe amends to our community or society as a whole. Though this may seem to be an abstract concept, we must make concrete amends by changing our behavior. If we harm society, we start to make amends by becoming a productive member of society. We contribute, we look for ways to give, not take. Our recovery is also a way of making amends to ourselves. We treated ourselves horribly in our act of addiction. The guilt and shame we felt each time we harmed another human being took quite a toll on our self-respect. Our addiction humiliated us in a thousand different ways. Now, in recovery we learn to treat ourselves in ways that demonstrate our self-respect. The most important results of the ninth step will be found within ourselves. This step teaches us a great deal about humility, love, selflessness, and forgiveness. We begin to heal from our addiction and no longer live with as many regrets. We grow spiritually and find that we are truly gaining a new level of freedom in our lives. Our past is just that, the past. We have put it behind us so that it no longer hovers on the edge of our thoughts, waiting for a chance to haunt our present. One of the most wonderful gifts we derive from working the ninth step is the knowledge that we are becoming better human beings. We realize how much we have changed because we are now 42. Longer doing the things for which we are making amends. We may not have realized how much we had changed in our recovery until now. The amends process drives home the knowledge that we are becoming truly different people. The extended nightmare of our addiction is finally beginning to fade in the dawning light of our recovery. Our humility increases as we face the people we have harmed. The impact of realizing how deeply our actions have affected other people shocks us out of our self-obsession. We begin to understand that other people have real feelings and that we are capable of hurting them if we are careless. We learn about being considerate of other people as we work this step, and what we learn is what we practice in our lives today. It becomes natural for us to think before we speak or act, keeping in mind that what we say or do is going to affect our friends, our families, and our fellow non-members. We approach people with love and kindness, carrying within ourselves a deep and abiding respect for the feelings of others. Because of the humility and selflessness so necessary in making our amends, we may be surprised at the way Step 9 enhances our self-esteem. One of the most paradoxical aspects of our recovery is that by thinking of ourselves less, we learn to love ourselves more. We may not have expected our spiritual journey to lead to a fresh appreciation of ourselves, but it does. Because of the love we extend to others, we realize our own value. We learn that what we contribute makes a difference, not just in Na but in the world at large. As a result of working the ninth step, we are free to live in the present, able to enjoy each moment and experience gratitude for the gift of recovery. Memories of the past no longer hold us back, and new possibilities appear.
We are free to go in directions we never considered before. We are free to dream and to pursue the fulfillment of our dreams. Our lives stretch out before us like a limitless horizon. We may stumble from time to time, but the tenth step gives us the opportunity to pick ourselves up and keep walking forward. Our higher power has given us an invitation to live, and we accept it with gratitude. Step 10. 43. We continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong promptly admitted it. Recovery in Narcotics Anonymous is about learning how to live. Incorporating the spiritual principles we learned in the first nine steps into our lives has made it possible to live in harmony with ourselves and others. Self-examination, confronting what we find in ourselves, and owning up to our wrongs are critical elements of conducting our lives on a spiritual basis. By working the tenth step, we become more aware of our emotions, our mental state, and our spiritual condition. As we do, we find ourselves constantly rewarded with fresh insight. Some of us look back at our fourth step and wonder why we have to do a tenth step. We may think that we've corrected all our past mistakes in the previous step. Since we have no intention of making those mistakes again, why should we continue with this relentless self-examination? The tenth step seems like a tiresome chore to some of us, a painful exercise that we could just as well avoid. But we must continue to grow, and that's exactly what the tenth step helps us do. Though we will return to the previous steps again and again, the tenth step furthers our spiritual healing in a different way. By creating an awareness of what's going on in our lives today. The importance of keeping in touch with our thoughts, attitudes, feelings, and behavior cannot be overemphasized. Every day, life presents us with new challenges. Our recovery depends on our willingness to meet those challenges. Our experience tells us that some members relapse, even after long periods of clean time, because they have become complacent in recovery, allowing their resentments to build and refusing to acknowledge their wrongs. Little by little, those small hurts, past truths, and, justified, grudges turn into deep disappointments serious self-deception, and full-blown resentment. We can't allow these threats to compromise our recovery. We have to deal with situations such as these as soon as they arise. In the tenth step, we use all the principles and actions we learned in the previous steps, applying them to our lives on a consistent basis. Beginning our days by reaffirming our decision to live life according to our higher powers will has helped many of us keep spiritual ideals foremost in our minds throughout the day. Even so, we are bound to make mistakes that are very familiar to us. We can attribute virtually every wrongdoing to a character defect we identified in the sixth step. Humbly asking the God of our understanding to remove our shortcomings is just as necessary now as it was in the seventh step. In the tenth step, we take such actions on a regular basis. Each day, we take our own inventory look for those times when we fall short of our spiritual ideals, and renew our efforts to live a principle-centered life. For example, when we are faced with the tendency to behave compulsively, ignoring the consequences of our actions, we need to focus on spiritual principles, take prompt action, and continue forward in our recovery. Although forming a habit of working this step may be difficult at first, 
we must persist. We can set aside some time during the day for focused self-appraisal while gradually moving toward a goal of being able to look at ourselves throughout the day. We keep going forward, striving each moment to become ever more aware of ourselves. We need to develop self-discipline. The more effort we put into doing so, the more we'll find that working the 10th step will become as natural as breathing. 44. Not that we should be hard on ourselves, picking at our every motive and looking for problems where none exist. We need to stay in tune with the voice of our conscience and listen to what it's telling us. When we get a nagging feeling that something isn't quite right, we should pay attention to it. If our feelings of guilt or anger seem to go on for a long time, we can do something about them. We know when something is bothering us perhaps not immediately, but usually not too long after the fact. As soon as we become aware that we're feeling ill at ease, we search out the cause and deal with it as soon as possible. While we strive to maintain ongoing awareness throughout the day, it is also helpful to sit down at the end of each day and quietly reflect on what has happened and how we responded to it. Often, our sponsor will suggest that we write out our 10th step. We may also make use of our informational pamphlet, Living the Program. In this step, we ask ourselves the same types of questions we asked in the fourth step. The only difference is that the emphasis is on today. We look at our current behavior and ask ourselves if we are living by our values. Am I being honest today? Am I maintaining personal integrity in my relations with others? Am I growing, or am I slipping back into old patterns? We concentrate on the overall picture of our day. In order to examine our day or our life, for that matter in its entirety, we have to draw on the humility we've acquired in the previous steps. We have learned quite a bit about ourselves, how we've responded to life in the past and how we want to respond to life now. It takes a great deal of awareness to humbly acknowledge our part in our own lives. We may have trouble knowing when we are wrong simply because we usually intend to be right. For instance, at some point in our recovery we may attend a group business meeting firmly convinced that we know what the group should do. We've studied all sides of the issues. We forcefully share our views at the meeting. We're so convinced of our rightness that we fail to recognize our self-righteousness. We are blind to the harm we're causing others by not respecting their views as much as our own. Often we act in ways that are contrary to our values, yet we expect others to live up to our standards. For instance, we may find ourselves flinching when we hear others gossiping about someone. Following such an occurrence, we are likely to be self-righteous until we catch ourselves doing the very same thing. Other situations can occur when we become supercritical of others. For example, we may have a tendency to have high expectations of others, however, we have a variety of excuses at hand for why these standards don't apply to us. If we find ourselves in the midst of such moral uncertainty, we can use the principles of the tenth step to provide more clarity. There may be other times in our lives when we find ourselves in a situation that seems to require a compromise of our personal beliefs and values. For instance, if we had gained employment at a company only to discover that our employer expected us to indulge in questionable business practices, we could reasonably expect to feel confused about the choices available to us. 
Deciding what to do about such a difficult dilemma would be a tough decision for any one of us. We may be tempted to make a snap judgment or expect our sponsor to provide an easy answer. However, we have found that no one can solve such a dilemma for us. While our sponsor will provide us with guidance, we must apply the principles of the program for ourselves and arrive at our own decision. In the end, we are the ones who must live with our conscience. In order to do so comfortably, we must decide what is, and what is not, morally acceptable in our lives. 45. It can be very confusing to determine when we were wrong, especially when we're right in the middle of a conflict. When our emotions are running high, we may not be able to take an honest look at ourselves. We can see only our immediate wants and needs. At such times, our sponsor may suggest that we take a personal inventory on a particular area of our lives so that we can see our part. If our friends notice that we're acting on a character defect, they may suggest that we talk to our sponsor about it. Being open-minded to the suggestions of our sponsor and our not friends, paying attention to what our conscience is telling us, spending some quiet time with the God of our understanding all these things will lead us to greater clarity. Once we're aware that we've been wrong whether it's five minutes, five hours, or five days after the fact we need to admit our error as soon as possible and correct any harm we've caused. As in the ninth step, we find that the process of admitting our mistakes and changing our behavior brings about tremendous freedom. Of course, we must be just as careful when amending our current behavior as we were when we made amends in the ninth step. For instance, if we find that we were wrong because we sat in a meeting silently judging someone who shared, we certainly don't need to go tell that person what we were thinking. Instead, we can make an effort to be more tolerant. We must remember that the tenth step isn't a one-sided endeavor, an exercise in noting what we have done wrong. We must resist any urge to become obsessive with this step, ruthlessly searching out every flaw in our character. The point of the tenth step is for us to be willing to pay attention to our thoughts, behaviors, and values, then work on what we need to change. We should acknowledge that, quite often, our motives are good and we do things right. Character defects and character assets do not exclude each other, and we are sure to find both on any given day. We develop recovery-oriented goals for ourselves as we work this step. When we see that we've been afraid to go forward in a particular area of our lives, we can resolve to take a few risks, drawing our courage from our higher power. When we see that we've been selfish, we can strive to become more generous in the future. When we realize today that we've fallen short in any area of our lives, we don't have to be overwhelmed by feelings of dread and fear of failure. Instead, we can be grateful for our self-awareness and begin to feel a sense of hope. We know that, by applying our program of recovery to our shortcomings, we will change and grow. We begin to see ourselves more realistically as a result of working the 10th step. Many of us have remarked on the freedom we experience through freely admitting our mistakes and releasing ourselves from unrealistic expectations. Where before we went from one extreme to another, either feeling better than everyone else or feeling worthless, we now find the middle ground where true self-worth can flourish. We feel renewed hope as we uncover long-neglected assets in this step.
we see ourselves as we really are, accepting our good qualities along with our defects, knowing we can change with the help of a higher power. We are becoming what we were meant to be all along, full human beings. Although all of us need the love and attention of others, that doesn't mean we must depend on people to provide what we can only find within ourselves. We can stop making unreasonable demands on others and begin to give of ourselves in relationships. Our romantic relationships, our friendships, and our interactions with family members, co-workers, and casual acquaintances are undergoing an astounding change. We are free to enjoy another's companions hip because we're no longer so obsessed with ourselves. We finally see that all the devices we use to keep. 46. Other people away are unnecessary at best and, more often than not, are the underlying cause of the pain we suffer in our relationships. Healthier relationships are just one indication that the quality of our lives has improved dramatically. Such indications merely reflect the intangible but very real changes that have taken place inside us. Our entire outlook has changed. Compared to the spiritual values we hold here today, concerns such as looking good or amassing material wealth pale in significance. By accepting the challenge of self-appraisal called for in the 10th step, we've discovered that we value our recovery and our relationship with the God of our understanding above all else. As the inner chaos that we lived with for so long subsides, we begin to experience long periods of serenity. During these times, we experience the powerful presence of a loving God in our lives. We are increasingly conscious of that power and are ready to search for ways to maintain and improve our contact with it. Seeking direction and meaning for our lives, we go on to the 11th step. Step 11. 47. We sought through prayer avid meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us avid the power to carry that out. Throughout our recovery, one of the things which stands out as a result of our working the steps is our success in building a relationship with the God of our understanding. Our initial efforts resulted in the decision we made in the third step. We continued by working the following steps, each one of which were designed to clear away whatever barriers might stand between our higher power and ourselves. As a result, we are open to receive our higher power's love and guidance directly into our lives. For many of us, the characteristics of our disease and the things we did in our active addiction separated us from our higher power. Our self-obsession made it difficult for most of us to even believe in a power greater than ourselves, much less achieve conscious contact with that power. We could see no purpose or meaning in our lives. Nothing could begin to fill the emptiness we felt. It seemed as though we shared no common bond with others at all. We felt alone in a vast universe, believing nothing existed beyond what our limited view allowed us to see. However, once we begin to recover, we find our obsession with ourselves diminishing and our awareness of the presence of a higher power growing. We've begun to see that we aren't alone and never have been. Through working the previous steps, we have already achieved a conscious contact with the God of our understanding. Our separation and isolation have ended. In the 11th step, we now seek to improve our conscious contact with the God of our understanding through prayer and meditation.
Many of us had trouble understanding the meaning of praying for power in the 11th step. At first glance, this seemed to contradict the most basic aspect of our recovery program, our admission of powerlessness. But if we take another look at the first step, we'll see that it says we were powerless over our addiction, not that we won't be given the power to carry out the will of the God of our understanding. We did begin at a point of powerlessness in the first step. We were powerless over our addiction and incapable of carrying out any will but our own. This doesn't mean we gain power over our addiction in the 11th step. In the 11th step, we pray for a particular kind of power, the power to carry out God's will. We no longer shy away from spiritual growth because it has become so essential to maintaining the peace of mind we found. Perhaps at the beginning of our recovery we worked the steps because we were in pain and afraid we would relapse if we didn't. But today we are motivated less by pain and fear, driven more by our longing for continued recovery. This leaning toward recovery reveals that we've surrendered more completely. We've reached a state where we actually believe that the will of a power greater than ourselves is better for us than our own will. It has become second nature for us to ask ourselves what our higher power would have us do in our lives rather than attempting to manipulate situations so they happen according to our ideas of what's best. We no longer see God's will for us as something we have to endure. On the contrary, we make a conscious effort to align our will with our higher powers, believing that we'll gain more happiness and peace of mind by doing so. This is what surrender is. A heartfelt belief in our own fallibility as human beings and an equally heartfelt. 48. Decision to rely on a power greater than our own. Surrender, the stumbling block of our addiction, has become the cornerstone of our recovery. However, we cannot recover on surrender alone. We must build on our surrender by taking action, just as we have in the previous steps. In the tenth step, we began to practice the discipline required to live spiritually on a daily basis. We continue practicing this principle in the 11th step by persisting in our efforts to take action each day. We place prayer and meditation high on our priority list. We resolve to make prayer and meditation as much a part of our daily routine as eating and sleeping, and then we employ the necessary self-discipline to achieve our resolve. To work this step, we must also increase the courage we've developed in the previous steps. Though the courage we demonstrated when we honestly and thoroughly examined ourselves was beyond anything we had previously experienced, we now need to develop a markedly different form of courage. We need the courage to live according to spiritual principles, even when we are afraid of the results. Despite our fear, we do what's necessary and draw on the endless well of courage we can find by tapping into a power greater than ourselves. With all this discussion of God, we may again find ourselves growing uncomfortable, perhaps wondering if this is where the religious catch we've anticipated is going to be revealed. We may wonder if our sponsor is now going to inform us that we must pray or meditate in a particular way. Before we get carried away with such fears, we would do well to remember one of the basic principles of recovery in Narcotics Anonymous, our absolute and unconditional freedom to believe in any higher power we choose in, of course, our right to communicate with our higher power in whatever way conforms to our individual beliefs. 
Although some of this practice is traditional religion, only rarely do we hear specific religious beliefs discussed in our meetings. We respect the rights of our members to form their own spiritual beliefs and tend to frown on anything with the potential to dilute the spiritual message of recovery. In this encouraging atmosphere, most of us find it relatively easy to discard our preconceived ideas of the right way to pray or meditate. Finding our own way is another matter. We may have a basic understanding of what prayer and meditation are. Prayer being the times we talk to a higher power and meditation the times we listen for a higher power's answers. We may not be aware of the many options that are open to us. Searching those options out and exploring their usefulness to us can be uncomfortable and time-consuming. It is only by being open-minded and by taking action that we are likely to find what is right for us as individuals. We may experiment with a whole assortment of practices until we find something that doesn't feel foreign or contrived. If we have found that everything feels strange, then we practice a form of prayer and meditation until it no longer seems unnatural. Many of us have adopted an eclectic approach, borrowing our practices from a variety of sources and combining those which provide us the greatest comfort and enlightenment. We are on a spiritual path which will lead us to a greater understanding of our higher power. Many of us have remarked on the great joy we find along the way. We are sure to get help from our fellow members or, perhaps, even from others who are also walking a spiritual path. Seeking out these individuals and asking for their guidance can help us find our own answers. However, sharing in another's experience does not excuse us from the need to seek our own. Others may be able to show us the path they walk, sharing with us the joy and insight they found along the way. Nevertheless, we may find our spiritual paths taking a different turn and have to adjust our method of travel accordingly. In the end, we find what's true for us in moments of personal. 49. Contact with our higher power. The experience shared by others is just that experience, not ultimate answers to the mysteries of life. Our understanding of a higher power grows and changes through prayer and meditation. We find that it is too limiting to define our higher power in such a way that our understanding is set in stone once and for all. An interesting parallel can be drawn if we remember the times we thoughtlessly tossed other human beings into categories and left them there. We deprived ourselves of an opportunity to know someone else on a deeper level. Treating our higher power as something to be defined will rob us on a grand scale, halting further spiritual growth the minute we arrive at an absolute definition. In addition to the open-mindedness so necessary to working the 11th step, it is vital that we actively pursue knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry it out. This knowledge is what we are searching for when we pray, whether our prayers are desperate pleas or calm requests for guidance. Regardless of our state of mind when asking for guidance, we can be sure that our consistent efforts to seek knowledge of our higher powers will for us will be rewarded. We should remember that step 11 asks us to pray only for the knowledge of God's will and the power to carry that out. Just as we opened our minds and avoided restricting our understanding of our higher power, we avoid placing limitations on what God's will for us can be. Though the temptation to pray for a particular result may be great, 
we must resist the urge to do so if we want to experience the rewards of the 11th step. Praying for specific solutions to specific problems is not the answer. For instance, at some time in our lives, we may feel unhappy but not know exactly what is causing such unhappiness. After spending a few minutes in prayer, seeking a specific solution to our unhappiness, we may suddenly get an idea that all our problems are caused by our boring job and demanding boss. We may even go to great lengths to convince ourselves that our idea was divinely inspired. We, as addicts, are subject to take such random thoughts and run with them, impulsively quitting our jobs. This scenario may seem extreme. Its point is that, by praying only for knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out, we can avoid our former tendency to allow fleeting whims and superstition to dictate the course of our lives. Knowledge of our higher powers will does not usually come in a momentary blinding flash, but in a gradual awakening brought about by the continued practice of prayer and meditation. Practicing the 11th step involves a daily discipline of prayer and meditation. This discipline reinforces our commitment to recovery, to living a new way of life, and to developing further our relations hip with our higher power. Through this daily practice, we begin to glimpse the limitless freedom we can be afforded through God's love. We have found that following such a discipline also results in a firm belief in our own right to happiness and peace of mind. We see that, regardless of the presence or absence of material success in our lives, we can be content. We can be happy and fulfilled with or without money, with or without a partner, with or without the approval of others. We've begun to see that God's will for us is the ability to live with dignity, to love ourselves and others, to laugh, and to find great joy and beauty in our surroundings. Our most heartfelt longings and dreams for our lives are coming true. These priceless gifts are no longer beyond our reach. They are, in fact, the very essence of God's will for us. In our gratitude, we go beyond merely asking for the power to live up to God's plan for our own lives. We begin to seek out ways to be of service, to make a difference in the life of another. 50. Addict, to carry the message of recovery. Our spiritual awakening has opened us up to spiritual contentment, unconditional love, and personal freedom. Knowing that we can only keep this precious gift by sharing it with others, we go on to step 12. Step 12. 51. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to addicts and to practice these principles in all our affairs. In a sense, step 12 encompasses all the steps. We must make use of what we've learned in the previous 11 as we carry the message and practice the principles of recovery in all our affairs. Individually and collectively, each step has contributed to the extraordinary transformation which we know as a spiritual awakening. Many of us have wondered how this spiritual awakening comes about. Does it happen all at once? Or does it occur slowly over a long period of time? While there may be great variations within our experience about this awakening of the spirit, we all agree that it results from working the steps. Our awakening has been progressive, beginning with a spark of awareness in the first step. Before we admitted the truth about our addiction, we knew only the darkness of denial. But when we surrendered, 
acknowledging that we couldn't arrest our addiction or hope for a better life on our own. A ray of light broke through the darkness, beginning our spiritual awakening. Though each individual's experience of a spiritual awakening varies, some experiences are so common as to be almost universal. Humility is one of these common factors. We first began to experience humility when we opened our minds to the possibility that a power greater than ourselves existed. For some of us, this experience was so astounding that we received an almost physical jolt from the knowledge that we weren't alone in our struggle for recovery. Step 2 allowed us our first glimpse of hope. That hope had an immediate and powerful effect on our despairing spirit, providing us with a reason to go on. Our desire for something different prompted us to a deeper level of surrender in the third step. Not only did we admit that we couldn't control our addiction, we went on to recognize that our will and lives would be better left to the care of our higher power. Paradoxically, in this admission we found our greatest strength. As we worked the third step, we began to understand that we could tap the limitless resource of our higher power for everything needed to heal us spiritually. This included the courage we knew we would need to work the fourth step. Many of us dreaded the process of self-appraisal called for in step 4, despite the gentle assurances of our fellow non-members that we would find spiritual rewards in the process. Though we were afraid, we went forward, somehow believing in the experience of other recovering addicts. Once our inventory was completed, we no longer needed condensing. In the process, we had experienced spiritual growth for ourselves. Our spirits were strengthened by our emerging integrity. The shaping of values, so essential to our character, was just one of the positive results we found in the fourth step. Unlike the admission we made in the first step, which was made in desperation, the admission we made in step 5 was voluntary. This complete disclosure of our innermost selves, made without reservation, resulted in a breakthrough in our ability to accept ourselves and trust others. Our sponsor's acceptance and our higher power's unconditional love made it possible for us to judge ourselves less harshly. We developed a little more humility with the awareness of the exact. 52. Nature of our wrongs. We began to understand that humility and self-loathing are incompatible and can't exist at the same time. With our awareness of the exact nature of our wrongs, our character defects and the humility inherent in that awareness, our desire to change increased dramatically as we worked step 6. Though we may have experienced some apprehension about surrendering our character defects, we overcame our fears by drawing on the trust and faith we had developed in a loving God. Trust and faith two important elements of a spiritual awakening, made it possible for us to become entirely ready to allow a power greater than ourselves to work in our lives. Consciously asking the God of our understanding to help us in step 7 was an important development in the awakening of our spirit. That request was tangible evidence of how much we had changed spiritually. This was the point where many of us began to sense the enormous difference that our higher power could make in our lives. Because we had asked for and been granted some freedom from having to act on our shortcomings, we finally began to grasp what the miracle of recovery offers us. Carried along by the promise of continued freedom in our lives, 
we proceeded, in step 8, to make ourselves aware of what we had done to others in our act of addiction. Again, we saw how the spiritual preparation of the previous steps made it possible for us to withstand the pain and remorse of listing the people we had harmed. Our willingness to make amends to them all brought us further away from the grip of self-obsession. Our search for recovery was no longer focused on what we could get out of it for ourselves. We saw beyond the confines of our own lives, and our efforts in recovery began to be more generous. We developed the ability to feel empathy for others. Once we had engaged in the process of making amends in the ninth step, we could see how it contributed to our spiritual growth. Our humility was enhanced by our newfound appreciation of others' feelings. Our self-esteem grew along with our increased capacity to forgive both ourselves and others. We were able to give of ourselves. Most of all, we gained freedom, freedom to live in the present and feel that we belonged in the world. The discipline we practiced in the tenth step ensured that we continued to breathe new life into our awakening spirits. We practiced ongoing adherence to our newfound values, thereby strengthening their importance in our lives. We saw that, by making our spiritual development our primary focus, other aspects of our lives would progress naturally as they were meant to all along. Focusing our attention on our spiritual development brought us to the 11th step. We had already become increasingly conscious of a powerful presence operating in our lives, a power that could rest toward our sanity and remove our shortcomings. Through recognizing the love demonstrated by such actions, we started to better understand the loving nature of our higher power. The spiritual void we felt at the beginning of our recovery has been filled with gratitude, unconditional love, and a desire to be of service to God and others. Undeniably, we have experienced a spiritual awakening. In order to cultivate this awakening, we have found it essential to express our gratitude and practice the principles of recovery in every area of our lives. However, this isn't something we do only to ensure that our own recovery continues. Narcotics Anonymous is not a selfish program. In fact, the spirit of the 12th step is grounded in the principle of selfless service. 53. Upholding this principle in our efforts to carry the message is of the utmost importance, both to our own spiritual state and to those to whom we are trying to carry the message. Step 12 has a paradoxical aspect in that the more we help others, the more we help ourselves. For instance, if we find ourselves troubled and our faith wavering, there are very few actions that have such an immediate uplifting effect on us as helping a newcomer. One small act of generosity can work wonders, our self-absorption diminishes and we end up with a better perspective on what previously seemed like overwhelming problems. Every time we tell someone else that Narcotics Anonymous works, we reinforce our belief in the program. When being of service in Narcotics Anonymous, many of us have chosen to give back to the program in the same way we were helped when new. Some of us whose first contact with knowledge through the area phone line have found it rewarding to serve on the phone line ourselves. Others have been drawn to hospitals and institution service work because we first heard the message of NA in a jail or hospital. Whatever form of service we choose to be involved in, we do so with our primary purpose of carrying the message in mind. 
Now we must ask ourselves, just what is, the message, we are trying to carry? Is it that we never have to use drugs again? Is it that, through recovery, we cease being likely candidates for jails, institutions, and an early death? Is it the hope that an addict, any addict, can recover from the disease of addiction? Well, it's all of this and more. The message we carry is that, by practicing the principles contained within the 12 steps, we have had a spiritual awakening. Whatever that means for each one of us is the message we carry to those seeking recovery. The ways in which we carry the message are as varied as our members. There are, however, some basic guidelines that we, as a fellowship, have found to be helpful. First and foremost, we share our experience, strength, and hope. This means that we share our experience, not the theories we have heard from other sources. This also means that we share our own experience, not someone else's. It is not our job to tell someone seeking recovery where to work, who to live with, how to raise their children, or anything else outside the realm of our experience with recovery. Someone we are trying to help may have problems in these areas. We can help best not by managing that person's life, but by sharing our own experience in those areas. Developing a personal style for carrying the message rests on a simple requirement, we must be ourselves. We each have a special, one-of-a-kind personality that is sure to be an attraction to many. Some of us have a sparkling sense of humor which may reach someone in despair. Some of us are especially warm and compassionate, able to reach an addict who has rarely been the recipient of kindness. Some of us have a remarkable talent for telling the truth, in no uncertain terms, to an addict literally dying to hear it. Some of us are a valuable asset on any service committee, while others do better working one-on-one -on -one with a suffering addict. Whatever our own personality makeup, we can be assured that when we sincerely try to carry the message, we can reach the addict seeking recovery. Yet there are limits to what we can do to help another addict. We cannot force anyone to stop using. We cannot give someone the results of working the steps, nor can we grow for them. We cannot magically remove someone's loneliness or pain. Not only are we powerless over our own addiction, we are powerless over everyone else's. We can only carry the message. We cannot determine who will receive it. It is absolutely none of our business to decide who is ready to hear the message of recovery and who is not. Many of us have formed such a judgment about an addict's desire for recovery and 54 have been mistaken. Multiple relapses do not necessarily signify a lack of interest in recovery, nor does the model newcomer demonstrate, without a doubt, a certainty of making it. It is our purpose and our privilege to share the message of recovery unconditionally with anyone expressing a desire to receive it. The principle of unconditional love is expressed in our attitude. Anyone who reaches out for help is entitled to our compassion, our attention, and our unconditional acceptance. Any addict, regardless of clean time, should be able to pour out his or her pain in an atmosphere free of judgment. Most of us have found that we are able to feel great empathy for those who suffer from our disease precisely because it is our disease. Our empathy isn't abstract, nor is our understanding. Instead, it is born in shared experience.
We greet each other with the recognition reserved for survivors of the same nearly fatal catastrophe. This shared experience, more than anything else, contributes to the atmosphere of unconditional love in our meetings. Helping others is perhaps the highest aspiration of the human heart and something we have been entrusted with as a result of a higher power working in our lives. We would do well to remember to ask the God of our understanding to continue working through us in our efforts to carry the message. Diligently practicing the principles of recovery will ensure that the connection between ourselves and our higher power remains open and that our service to others is firmly rooted in spirituality. Spirituality becomes a way of life for us as we live by the principles of recovery. The example of a life lived according to these principles is potentially the most powerful message we can carry. We don't need to wait until we're on the second step to practice the principle of open-mindedness. Courage and honesty have a place in our lives even when we aren't writing an inventory. Humility is always a desirable state, whether we are asking the God of our understanding to remove our shortcomings, conducting business with a co-worker, or talking to a friend. To practice the principles of recovery in all our affairs is what we strive for. Both in and out of meetings, no matter who is involved, no matter how difficult it may seem, we make the principles of recovery the guides by which we live. Only through the practice of these principles in our daily life can we hope to achieve the spiritual growth necessary to maintain our reprieve from the disease of addiction. Though this may seem a lofty goal, we have found it attainable. Our gratitude for the gift of recovery becomes the underlying force in all we do, motivating us and weaving its way through our lives and the lives of those around us. Even in silence, the voice of our gratitude does not go unheard. It speaks most clearly as we walk the path of recovery, selflessly giving to those we meet along the way. We venture forth on our spiritual journey, our lives enriched, our spirits awakened, and our horizons ever expanding. The quintessential spirit that lies inside each one of us, the spark of life that was almost extinguished by our disease, has been renewed through working the 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous. It is on the path paved with these steps that our future journey begins. 55. Book to the 12 Traditions. The Traditions portion of it works. How and why serves as a resource for NA groups and the individual member. The book seeks to express your the spiritual principles within the traditions, engage members with the spirit not the law of the traditions, and provide a basis for thought and discussion about the traditions. This portion of the book is not meant to fulfill every need for every group or every member, Rather, it is to be a book that will generate discussion and allow for local interpretation of the practical application of the principles contained in the traditions. Tradition 1. 56. Our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends on non-unity. Narcotics Anonymous is more than just the first meeting we attend or the other now meetings in our neighborhood. We are part of a much greater whole. Addicts apply the principles of Narcotics Anonymous in their personal recovery across town and around the world. Just as we learned in early recovery that we need each other to stay clean, we come to believe that all of us, every now meeting in group, are interdependent. We share an equal membership in NA, 
and we all have an interest in maintaining the unity that underlies its common welfare. Unity is the spirit that joins thousands of members around the world in a spiritual fellowship that has the power to change lives. One way to look at placing our common welfare first is to say that each of us is equally responsible for Nas' well-being. In our recovery, we have found that living clean is very difficult without the support of other members. Our individual recovery depends on meetings that take place regularly, other recovering addicts who participate, and sponsors who share with us how to stay clean. Even members who can't get to meetings depend on the support of fellow addicts, maintaining contact with phone calls, letters, and non-loner groups. As each individual member relies on the support of the fellowship for survival, the NAS survival depends on its members. Our first tradition encourages not only our members but our groups to place our common welfare first. Most groups conduct most of their affairs on their own. In attending to the details of their week-in, week-out routines, autonomous NAS groups may lose sight of the bigger picture. In the larger frame, each group is a strand in the supporting fabric of Narcotics Anonymous as a whole. Without that fabric, there would be no NAS. The importance of our unity encourages our groups to look beyond their own little worlds to the common needs of the worldwide NAS. Fellowship, placing the welfare of the whole before their own. The relationship described in the first tradition is reciprocal. Groups work together in a spirit of cooperation to ensure the survival of Narcotics Anonymous. In turn, those groups receive strength and support from every other group and all our services. The strength of our mutual commitment to not create the unity that binds us to ether in spite of all that might divide us. The common welfare of NA depends on the continued growth and well-being of the fellowship in every corner of the world. Our shared commitment to recovery and to our common welfare gives us a personal stake in the unity of NA. In meetings, we find a new place to belong, new friends, and a hope for a better life. A feeling of care and concern grows between us and the group. We learn to treat others with kindness and respect and do what we can to support each other in our group. Sometimes we comfort each other merely by being present. At other times, a phone call or letter simply to say hello can make a world of difference. Our relationships with other addicts are a source of strength in our personal recovery. We come to rely on meetings and on each other for that support. The unity we see in our meetings is an expression not only of our reliance on each other but our mutual reliance on spiritual principles and a higher power. Non-unity begins with our recognition of the therapeutic value of one addict helping another. We help each other in different ways. Sometimes we help each other one-on-one, -on -one, as in sponsorship. 57. Or we may help each other by participating in the formation of new meetings to make NA accessible to more addicts. Many groups are formed when members of a more established group decide to start another meeting. Sharing the responsibility enhances our common welfare and creates unity among non-members who work together. Groups flourish with the loving support of addicts helping addicts. We strengthen our unity by participating in each other's recovery. The unity described in our first tradition is not the same thing as uniformity. Our membership is richly varied, made up of many addicts from widely differing backgrounds. 
These members bring with them a variety of ideas and talents. That diversity enriches the fellowship and gives rise to new and creative ways to reach addicts who need our help. Our purpose to carry the message to the addict who still suffers allows room for everyone to serve. When we unite in support of this purpose, our differences need no longer detract from our common welfare. Working together for our mutual well-being is a significant source of unity in Narcotics Anonymous. While we often think of unity as a feeling or a condition, unity doesn't just happen. The unity underlying our common welfare requires personal commitment and responsible action. For example, when we accept personal responsibility for supporting our home group, we further non-unity and enhance the common welfare of the whole fellowship. Our commitment to unity strengthens our groups, allowing us to carry a message of hope. Meetings flourish in this atmosphere of hope. The fellowship grows and our common welfare increases as a result of our united efforts. Communication goes a long way toward building and enhancing our common welfare. With an attitude of open-mindedness, we seek to understand other perspectives. Reports may tell us a lot about what's happening in other groups or areas, but our common welfare depends on more than just information. True communication involves an effort on our part to listen, as we read or hear reports, seeking a better understanding of the needs and problems of both our own group and other groups, wherever they may be. Encouraging each member to speak openly from the heart enhances our ability to work together. Regular reports, thorough discussion, and active listening lead us to the kind of understanding that helps us find creative solutions that benefit us all. Today's decisions may affect tomorrow's members. When we think of solutions to our current problems, it's not hard to consider the needs of our group, our area, our region, or even the worldwide fellowship. But it's also important to remember the unseen members in our discussions the members yet to come. When we work to ensure the vitality of NA, we're not working just for ourselves but for those yet to join us. The unity that supports our common welfare is created not only by working together but by playing together. The friendships we develop outside meetings strengthen non-unity. Fellowship activities provide opportunities for us to relax, socialize with each other, and have fun. Conventions, dinners, and holiday celebrations give us a chance to celebrate our recovery while practicing social skills. Picnics, dances, and sports days, for example, often allow our families to participate, too. We strengthen our sense of community when we share more than just meeting time. Stronger relationships develop as we become more involved in each other's lives. The care and understanding born of these relationships are strong threads in the fabric of non-unity. Applying Spiritual Principles 58. In the 12 steps of Na, we learn to apply principles to better our lives. Moved by the miracle of personal recovery we reach out to share that miracle with others. This is the essence of being of service in Na. In supporting our unity, we first apply principles to guide our own behavior. As truth, we use the same principles for guidance. That guidance engenders a sense of unity that strengthens our ability to reach out to others, enhancing our common welfare. 
some of the principles that seem particularly important to unity include surrender and acceptance, commitment, selflessness, love, and anonymity. As we practice these principles, we will find others that strengthen unity as well. Surrender and acceptance open the door to unity. As our trust in a higher power grows, it gets easier to let go of our personal desires and stop fighting for what we want. With an attitude of surrender, working together in a group becomes easier. Tradition 1 presents a picture of addicts working together worldwide to support each other's recovery. We try to remember this goal in all our actions, as individuals or as groups. If we find that our personal desires are the aims of our group conflict with that ideal, Unity asks us to surrender our own desires and accept guidance that enhances the greater good of Narcotics Anonymous. Only by deciding to be part of that whole can we support the unity so essential to our personal survival. Commitment is another essential ingredient in unity. Personal commitment to our shared sense of purpose is one of the ties that bind us together. When we know that we belong in Na, and when we make a commitment to stay, we become a part of the greater whole. Our sense of belonging is closely related to our degree of commitment to recovery in Na. As groups, the combined strength of that commitment is a powerful force in serving others. With that strong commitment, we are able to carry the message of hope that will support us all in our recovery. Commitment is a decision supported by our belief in Na as a way of life. Regular meeting attendance is one of the ways in which we live out that belief. Greeting newcomers as they arrive or giving our telephone number to someone who needs help also reflects our decision. Sponsorship, sharing in meetings, setting up chairs before a meeting all these are ways in which we express our commitment. Each member finds a level of service that fits comfortably into a balanced program of recovery. Selflessness is another indispensable element in unity. The principles we learn in the steps help us let go of our selfishness and lovingly serve the needs of others. To keep our groups healthy, we place the needs of our group ahead of our own personal desires. The same principle applies to our affairs as a group. Setting aside what we may want as a group, we think about the needs of the fellowship and seek ways to support our common good. Our ability to survive as a fellowship and to reach others depends on our unity. Love is a principle that is expressed in the practice of goodwill toward one another. We contribute to unity in our meetings by exercising loving care in the way we speak and the way we treat one another. We try to share our experience, strength, and hope in a way which demonstrates that recovery is available in Narcotics Anonymous. An atmosphere of love and care in our meetings helps members feel comfortable and safe. The love we show each other attracts newcomers and strengthens us all, fueling our sense of unity and common welfare. Anonymity, the spiritual foundation of our tradition, supports non-unity as well. When we apply anonymity to the first tradition, we overlook the differences that would separate us. In the context of unity, anonymity means that the message of recovery is for every addict who wants it. 59. We learn to set aside our prejudices and focus on our common identity as addicts. Each of us has an equal right to and responsibility for the well-being of Narcotics Anonymous. Just as anonymity is the spiritual foundation of our traditions, 
community spoken of in the first tradition is the practical foundation on which we may build strong and successful groups. Each succeeding tradition builds upon the strength of our unity as a fellowship, recalling the vital importance of the common welfare to each individual member and group. With unity as our practical foundation, we find that our relationship with one another is more important than any issue that may arise to divide us. No problem or disagreement is more significant than our need for each other's support. The fundamental importance of our common welfare strengthens our understanding of all the other traditions. Many questions can be answered simply by determining how the action we contemplate will affect the unity of the fellowship. Will it serve to divide us, or will it bring us closer together? Unity is the spirit that joins members around the world in a spiritual fellowship that has the power to change lives. By striving to see beyond our individual ideas and the interests of our own group, we come to understand that the common welfare of all now must come first. Through our trust in a loving higher power, we find the strength to work together toward our shared goal of recovery from addiction. In the unity that grows in trust, we are ready to work together for our common good. Tradition 2. 60. For our group purpose there is but one ultimate authority a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants, they do not govern. Tradition 2 builds on the practical foundation of Tradition 1. We begin with unity, founded on the strength of our commitment to recovery in Narcotics Anonymous. Our commitment is reflected in service that builds our common welfare, supporting a meeting, sharing with other members, sponsorship, any of the ways in which we reach out to other addicts. As groups, too, our purpose is to serve, to carry the message. Everything we do in service to NA is related to that purpose. Without direction, however, our services might lack consistency. To guide us in serving others, we seek direction from a higher power. Personal service arises from the application of principles. Ideally, personal service is founded in a relationship with the same higher power that guides our personal recovery. This higher power also guides the various elements of our fellowship. Our direction in service comes from a God of our understanding, whether we serve as individuals, as a group, or as a service board or committee. Whenever we come together, we seek the presence and guidance of this loving higher power. This direction then guides us through all our actions. Everybody has opinions on how to serve more effectively. When we each propose a different plan for any course of action, how do we choose among them? Who has the final say in our discussion? Our answer is that a loving God, the source of our unity, has the final say the same higher power that guides our personal recovery. If we are to find guidance from an ultimate authority, we need to find means of hearing that guidance together. The mechanism we use is group conscience. The success of the group conscience process depends on our willingness as individuals to seek guidance from a higher power on a personal level. We then bring that willingness into the group setting. Something happens when we practice the steps and learn to apply principles in our individual lives. We develop an awareness of our behavior and its effects on ourselves and others. In other words, we develop a conscience. This conscience is a reflection of our relationship with a higher power. 
It reflects the guidance we receive from the God of our understanding and our commitment to follow that guidance. Whenever we come together in our groups, a similar process may occur, a collective conscience develops. That conscience reflects the relationship of our members to a loving higher power. When consulted regularly, that collective conscience guides us in fulfilling our primary purpose while preserving our unity and common welfare. Group conscience can be thought of in much the same way as personal conscience. Group conscience reflects a collective awareness of, understanding of, and surrender to spiritual principles. The conscience of a group takes shape and is revealed when its members take the time to talk with each other about their personal needs, the needs of that group, and the needs of NA as a whole. Each member draws upon his or her relationship with a higher power when 61. Sharing with the group As members listen carefully to each other and consult their personal understanding of a loving God, something happens, solutions to problems become apparent, solutions that take into consideration the needs of everyone concerned. In developing a group conscience, a clear mutual understanding or consensus arises. Based upon the understanding gained by sharing group conscience, a group may move on to a vote in order to make decisions. In the best of circumstances, however, the group continues discussion until it reaches unanimity. The resulting solution may be so obvious that no vote is needed. Group conscience is not fixed and inflexible. We know that personal conscience changes as an individual's relationship with a higher power grows and strengthens. In the same way, the conscience of a group evolves as its members mature in recovery, new members arrive, and the group's situation changes. Group conscience is a process that may work differently under differing circumstances. It's not reasonable to expect that today's solution to one group's needs will always be sufficient for every group. In fact, that solution may not even apply to the same group at a different time. The principles involved in group conscience are always the same, but the times and conditions our conscience guides us through are constantly changing, requiring our conscience to tell us different things in different settings. It's important for us to continue cultivating our group conscience, seeking the guidance of a loving higher power whenever a question arises. A surrender to group conscience means we allow our fellowship to be shaped by a loving higher power. We are tempted sometimes to take control of the daily affairs of our group, our service board, or our committee, believing that our great concern for the fellowship's welfare could never lead us astray. However, as we become more trusting, we realize that the group is directed by a loving higher power. Our reliance on that higher power is demonstrated by our willingness to carry out the direction expressed in our group conscience, believing that all will be well. Any group, board, or committee can become bogged down in disagreement or sidetracked by seemingly insurmountable problems. In these situations, it's important to focus our attention on the principles of the program and the solutions they point toward, not on our problems. Agreement is reached when we step out of the way and allow a loving higher power to direct us. Only when we listen for the direction of a higher power are we able to hear it. The conscience of a group is most clearly expressed when every member is considered an equal. A higher power works through all of us, regardless of clean time or experience. 
group conscience always exists, but we are not always willing or able to hear it or allow its expression. Hearing group conscience may take time and patience. A flexible approach invites a loving higher power into our group conscience process. In our personal recovery our thoughts and actions change as we stay clean and grow spiritually. We don't get better overnight, and sometimes our growth is sporadic and uneven. This same pattern of growth and maturation also occurs in our fellowship. As our groups grow and evolve, our resources change and so do our needs. Groups may change trusted servants, meeting format. 62. Or location, depending on their resources and their needs. Service committees may express in their subcommittees, reach out into new territories, or combine their efforts with other committees. These changes may not always feel like progress. Just as our personal recovery doesn't always develop in an orderly fashion, our fellowship doesn't always evolve as we would expect. As groups and committees go through this growing process, their collective conscience often evolves as well. Changes in the group conscience are not a cause for alarm, merely part of the growing process. When a group or committee has sought direction from a loving higher power, it may ask some of its members to help carry out that direction. When we ask members to serve, we don't set them apart as being somehow better than the rest of us. Leadership in NA is a service, not a class of membership. For this reason, we call our leaders trusted servants. When we choose a member to serve us in some capacity, we exercise mutual trust. We trust the conscience that influenced our selection since it reflects our collective relationship with a loving higher power. We extend that trust to the members we have selected to serve. We have faith that they will apply principles in their actions seek and share the most complete information available, and work to further the group's well-being and our fellowship's common welfare. The relationship of trusted servants to the group is reciprocal. Members chosen to serve are asked to do so with dedication and fidelity, and those who have chosen them are responsible to support their servants. When we are asked to serve, we understand that we are responsible to a loving higher power as expressed in the group conscience. We acknowledge this responsibility when we approach service with a selfless and loving attitude. The principles embodied in the traditions apply to all our actions. We can look to our individual conscience as well as the collective conscience for guidance in all we must do in fulfilling our responsibilities. This connection with the group conscience is enhanced when, as trusted servants, we carry a continuous flow of information that is honest and open, it is further strengthened when we seek to serve, not to govern. We help form the conscience of our group or committee, through the direction of a higher power, by presenting a complete and unbiased stream of information. The ideas and direction of the group, then, are conveyed in our representation of that conscience. Our trusted servants lead us best when they lead by personal example. Ideally, we choose them for the principles of recovery we see at work in their lives. We encourage our trusted servants to remain open to new ideas, to become knowledgeable about all aspects of service in NA, and to continue to seek personal recovery. All of these attributes are essential to their ability to serve as well. Applying Spiritual Principles we noted earlier in this chapter that personal service arises from the practice of principles.
By applying these principles, we learn to seek direction. We talk to our sponsor, share with our na. 63. Friends, and listen for a higher power's guidance. Some of the principles that seem to be important in tradition to include surrender, faith, humility, open-mindedness, integrity, and anonymity. We begin with surrender to our ultimate authority, the God of our understanding, with whom we have developed a personal relationship. In this case, we surrender to the direction of that higher power as it is revealed in our group conscience. We renew our commitment to the common welfare of now when we place the needs of the fellowship ahead of our own desires. Faith is our reliance on a loving higher power put into action. The application of this spiritual principle lets us surrender to the group conscience with hope instead of fear. It is a constant reminder that our direction comes from a power greater than our own. Faith demands courage, since we often practice an active demonstration of faith in spite of our anxiety. Our faith is strengthened through the experience of seeing a loving higher power work in our fellowship. Humility in practice is the honest assessment of our strengths and weaknesses. That kind of assessment is a necessary ingredient in our willingness to surrender. Humility prepares us to set aside our personal wishes so that we can effectively serve our fellowship. We look to humility, first, to remind us that we aren't personally capable of guiding the affairs of Narcotics Anonymous. We are reminded of our source of strength, a loving higher power. By practicing humility in our efforts to serve, we make room for open-mindedness. We remember that, just as we need the experience of other addicts to recover, so do we need their direction and ideas in order to serve. We learn to actively cultivate our listening skills, using our ears more than our mouths in conversation. When we are open-minded, we hear and accept solutions offered by others in the development of group conscience. Application of this principle teaches us to set aside our prejudices in order to work with others. By practicing open-mindedness, we nurture an attitude of goodwill toward others and become willing to serve with our common good in mind. Only with an open mind can we recognize the guidance of a loving higher power. Integrity is the consistent application of spiritual principles, no matter what the circumstances. Leaders who demonstrate this quality inspire our trust. We serve best when we display an honest respect for the trust placed in us by others. Fidelity and devotion to that trust reflect the personal integrity of our servants. When we choose members to serve us, we often look for integrity as a sign that they are trustworthy. The spiritual principle of anonymity reminds us that we are all equal in Narcotics Anonymous. No one member or group has a monopoly on the knowledge of a higher power's will. We practice anonymity by offering our love, attention, and respect to everyone, regardless of our personal feelings toward any individual. Every member has a part in the development of group conscience. We are all equal in the expression of a conscious contact with a higher power of our understanding. 64. Tradition 2 offers guidance for our relationships with others. A loving higher power is the source of direction for Na as a whole. This higher power is also the source of the principles that we apply when we serve. We can use these principles when we seek direction as individuals, groups, service boards, or committees. 
service is for those who serve. Our best talent in service is the ability to reach other addicts, offer identification and welcome, greet the addicts walking in the door for the first time, and help ensure that newcomers return again and again. Any one of us is capable of offering that service. With the guidance of a loving higher power, we become better able to help others. Service to the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous has its own rewards. When we practice spiritual principles in our daily lives, a stronger relationship with our higher power develops. Our relationship with our group and the fellowship grows stronger, too. Service in NA is a learning experience that allows us personal growth. We begin to look beyond our own interests, setting aside our self-centered view of life in order to better serve the whole. We benefit spiritually in return for our unselfish service. Tradition 3. 65. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop using. Narcotics Anonymous offers recovery to addicts around the world. We focus on the disease of addiction rather than any particular drug. Our message is broad enough to attract addicts from any social class or nationality. When new members come to meetings, our sole interest is in their desire for freedom from active addiction and how we can be of help. The third tradition helps not offer recovery to so many addicts by freeing us from having to make judgments about prospective members. It eliminates the need for membership committees or applications. We are not asked to make decisions about anyone's fitness for recovery. Since the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop using, we as members have no reason to judge each other. Desire is not a measurable commodity. It lives in the heart of each individual member. Because we can't judge the sole requirement for membership, we are encouraged to open wide the doors of our meetings to any addict who wishes to join. We are asked to extend to others the care and concern that help each of us find a sense of belonging. The third tradition helps not grow by encouraging us to welcome others. Membership is a personal decision reached by each individual. We can do a lot to allow addicts the freedom to make that decision and reaffirm their commitment to recovery. We can help them feel comfortable in our group by greeting them at the door, sharing with other addicts before or after the meeting, and exchanging telephone numbers. We try to make sure that any addict who attends our meeting is not turned away. To the extent that it's possible, we choose the most accessible location for our meetings. We may choose a format that reflects an invitational tone. Most of all, we encourage every addict to keep coming back. The strength of any member's desire is not necessarily connected to any outside circumstance. What makes one addict stay clean while another returns to using? No one of us can judge who will stay to recover and who will return to active addiction. There are no guarantees based on types of drugs used or using history. We cannot predict a higher success rate for addicts of a certain age, or those who used for a certain number of years, or women over men, or any other external factor. Just as we are not capable of measuring another's desire to stay clean, neither are we equipped to decide who should join. We are free to offer welcome instead of judgment. We look for ways to help instead of judge. Our task is to fan the flame of desire, not dampen it. Any addict who walks into a meeting, even a using addict, displays a level of willingness that cannot be discounted.
While maintaining an emphasis on the importance of total abstinence, still using addicts are welcomed into our meetings with special encouragement to keep coming back. Many recovering addicts do not have access to regular meetings because of incarceration, geography, physical disability, or employment. These addicts are members in every respect as long as they have the day ire to stop using, and they are entitled to the same consideration and support as any other member. Addicts attend their first meeting for many reasons. Our motives for coming to NA aren't particularly important. The desire to stop using may not be clearly realized, it may be no more than a subtle yearning for relief from pain. But this yearning often drives us to seek solutions we might otherwise never consider. Often the experience of hearing other addicts share about 66. Recovery will ignite the desire to stop using. Others come to a meeting, hear the message, and return to active addiction. Those who return to meetings after relapse often say their desire to stop using was born from the pain of relapse. We come to NA for many reasons, but we stay to recover when we find and keep the desire to stop using. The group is not the jury of desire. We cannot measure or arbitrate willingness. Any addict's willingness to come to a meeting ought to be a sufficient indication of desire. It may take a while for an addict to find the desire that will keep her or him in Narcotics Anonymous. No addict should be denied an opportunity to stay long enough to develop that desire. We can nurture that desire with loving acceptance. The wording of the third tradition reflects the broad focus of our first step. It's written simply enough to include addicts of all countries and cultures, no matter what drugs they use. Before finding recovery in NA, many addicts don't think that alcohol is a problem. Others abuse prescription medication, thinking that, legal, drugs are okay. Because of the wording of this tradition, we are able to attract and welcome addicts who might think they didn't use the, right, drugs to qualify for membership in NA. Each addict should be allowed to decide if NA is the answer for him or herself. We cannot make the decision for others. Although the third tradition is written simply, we know that when it talks about a desire to stop using, it means using drugs. We understand that NA is a program of recovery for drug addicts. Although addiction takes on a broader meaning for many of us as we continue in recovery it's important to remember that we first came to NA because of our drug problems. If new members are to feel that they belong in NA, they need to hear something they can identify with. They find that identification in the fellowship of recovering addicts in Narcotics Anonymous. Many of us know when we walk into our first meeting that we're addicts. It's not something we have to decide, it's just a fact of life. Membership however, means more than just being an addict, it means making a decision. If we identify with what we hear in NA and relate with the people we meet, we will want what NA offers. So long as we have a desire to stop using, we are free to make the decision to join Narcotics Anonymous. Then, once we've made that decision, we need to follow it with a commitment to the principles of NA. With that commitment, we set ourselves squarely on the road of recovery. Applying Spiritual Principles The third tradition encourages freedom from judgment. It leads us on the path of service toward an attitude of helpfulness, acceptance, and unconditional love. As we've seen in the previous traditions, 
Our path of service arises from the application of principles. Some of the principles that support this tradition include tolerance, compassion, anonymity, and humility. Tolerance reminds us that judgment is not our task. The disease of addiction does not exclude anyone. Nah, likewise, cannot exclude any addict who desires to stop using. We learn to be tolerant of ad ICTS from different backgrounds than ours, remembering that we are not better than any other addict in a meeting. Addiction is a deadly disease. We know that addicts who don't find recovery can expect nothing better than jails, institutions, and death. Refusing admission to any addict, even one who comes merely out of curiosity may be a death sentence for that addict. We learn to practice tolerance of addicts who don't look like us, think like us, or share like us. We teach by example, pressuring. 67. New members to talk or act like we do may send them back to the streets. It certainly denies them the right to recover and learn in their own way. Compassion lends kindness to all our efforts in service to others. With compassion as the foundation of our actions, we learn to support members through any difficulties they may experience. All too often, we are quick to judge the quality of another's recovery or willingness. Tradition 3 asks us to set aside our self-righteousness. Because the only requirement for membership is a quality we cannot measure, the right to judge another's desire is denied us. Our attitude ought to be one of loving acceptance toward all addicts, regardless of any other problems they may experience. Generous application of compassion is more therapeutic to the suffering addict than a free application of judgment. Humility reminds us that we are not God. We cannot predict another's readiness to hear the message. We try to remember our own fear and confusion in our first meeting. We need each other's help and encouragement, not criticism or rejection. Our awareness of our own shortcomings, exercised in humility, helps us remember this. The self-acceptance that often accompanies humility makes us reluctant to judge others harshly. Anonymity is the principle that supports the openness of our groups and our freedom to welcome everyone as equals. NA has no classes of membership and no second class members. The common denominator in NA is the disease of addiction. We are all equally subject to its devastation. We share an equal right to recovery. The practice of anonymity ensures the integrity of Tradition 3. In the spirit of anonymity, we remember that no individual member or group is more important than the message we carry. The single requirement for membership helps ensure that no addict need die without having a chance to recover. We celebrate our equality and the freedom we share by welcoming any addict who has the desire to stop using. Tradition 3 spells freedom for the members of NA. It sets the sole requirement for membership in the heart of each individual member. We don't have to decide for anyone else. We don't have to expend time and energy on deciding who should stay or who we should help. Instead, we are free to extend loving assistance to anyone who walks into a meeting desiring freedom from addiction. Tradition 4. 68. Each group should be autonomous, except in matters affecting other groups or NA as a whole. NA groups have a great deal of freedom. We've already seen in Tradition 3 that groups are free of any need to screen their members or set requirements for membership. Our NA groups are free to offer recovery to any addict. 
The fourth tradition enhances that freedom, allowing the rich diversity of our varied experience to help us serve. Freedom can be exhilarating. Many of us have little experience with freedom of any sort. Our lived and active addiction often seemed more like slavery. When we first experience the freedom of recovery we may find it overwhelming. Through working the steps, we learn that with freedom comes responsibility. In recovery, we become responsible for ourselves. As we accept that responsibility, we see how the fourth tradition encourages us to act responsibly as groups and as a fellowship. Now groups are vehicles for the message of recovery. In the strength of the personal commitment group members make to one another, a group character forms. As this group character grows and evolves, the group finds ways in which it can do what no other group in town may be doing. The members of each group design a blueprint for meetings that reflect that particular group's personality. Group autonomy gives groups the creative freedom to find individual ways to carry the message. NA is made up of a vastly diverse assortment of addicts joined together by the strength of their mutual commitment to recovery. We speak many different languages and live in differing cultures. One type of meeting will not appeal to every addict who comes to Narcotics Anonymous. In order to reach every addict who may need our help and support the recovery of every member, groups have the freedom to vary their format and other meeting characteristics. Each group has the freedom to pursue our primary purpose in the manner it feels will work best. Every group has a niche to fill, both in the fellowship as a whole and in the local NA community. As a fellowship, our ability to reach still using addicts is tied to our willingness to offer meetings that are accessible and attractive to those addicts. With the creative freedom offered by autonomy, we are encouraged to seek a particular role that meets the needs of both the NA community and our own group. We are free to make each group the very best it can be. The vitality of Narcotics Anonymous is enhanced by each group's willingness to find its niche and fill it. Creative freedom challenges the groups to be strong and responsible. Members may support many meetings with their attendance, but most make a commitment to support one group in particular. Members grow in their personal recovery when they take responsibility for their lives. In the same way, groups grow and become stronger when their members take collective responsibility for maintaining their meetings. Groups reflect the responsibility and commitment of their members. One of the most common ways in which groups express their autonomy is in the choice of meeting format. Most NA communities will offer a number of different types of meetings, from speaker meetings to step studies to topic discussions or any other format or combination of formats that meets the needs of local members. Some meetings will be open to the public, while 69. Others will be for addicts only. Larger communities may offer several different types of meetings each night. Some addicts will hear the message of recovery better in one type of meeting, while others prefer another format. And not a community that offers a variety of meetings is more likely to reach a broad cross-section of addicts. In a spirit of cooperation, we try to respect the autonomy of other groups by allowing them the freedom to carry the message in whatever manner seems best to them. In the spirit of autonomy, many groups hold meetings that appeal to members with similar needs. The freedom from judgment expressed in the third tradition is aimed at helping any addict, anywhere, feel comfortable in NA. 
No matter how a group structures its meetings, all non-groups are encouraged to keep the focus of their meetings on recovery from the disease of addiction. As long as a group observes the 12 traditions and espouses the 12 steps of NA in its meetings, it may consider them Narcotics Anonymous meetings. Sometimes it's hard to know what affects NA as a whole. The fourth tradition offers a way to balance the freedom of autonomy with our responsibility to preserve non-unity. We are challenged in Tradition 4 to apply autonomy in ways that will enhance the growth and vitality of NA. Autonomy encourages groups to become strong and lively but also reminds them that they are a vital part of a greater whole, the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous. We consider our common welfare when we make decisions in our groups. Since most groups are not directly connected with each other, we might think that whatever happens in our meetings has no effect on anyone else. When we consider who is affected by our group, we have to look at other groups, the attic yet to come, the newcomer, and the neighborhood in which we hold our meetings. We have an effect on other groups for NA as a whole if we're not recognizable as a NA meeting. It helps to remember what we needed to hear when we were new, hope for recovery from drug addiction. Addicts first coming to NA often look closely for differences, hoping that somehow they won't fit in. It's not difficult to alienate an addict. It's important to think about the message we send to newcomers in our meetings. Thoughtful consideration of our primary purpose may help ensure that meetings will be available for those addicts yet to come. It's also important to consider how we're viewed by society. When NA meetings first began in many places, it was illegal for addicts to meet under any circumstances. Even where meetings are legal, the public often views groups of addicts with alarm. Until NA has established a good public reputation, it may be difficult for addicts to find meeting places. If our behavior as NA members is still destructive and selfish, we will once again have difficulty meeting openly. We help protect our reputation as a fellowship when we use our meeting facilities with respect, keeping them clean and in good repair. We should take care to act like good neighbors, conducting ourselves respectfully. Even something as simple as the name of group chooses may reflect on NA as a whole. If the public reputation of Narcotics Anonymous is somehow impaired, addicts may die. Autonomy does not relieve groups of their obligation to observe and apply the spiritual principles embodied in the traditions. Careful consideration of the group's observation of the fourth tradition often takes the form of a group inventory, helping members gauge their success at carrying the message and reaching addicts in their neighborhood. At the same time, groups can examine their part in contributing to the unity of NA as a whole. The fourth tradition guides us away from self-centeredness by giving us the freedom to act responsibly as groups. Applying Spiritual Principles 70. The fourth tradition helps groups achieve a balance between independence and responsibility. This mirrors the freedom of the individual recovering member and the responsibility which supports that freedom. Together with open-mindedness, unity, and anonymity, these principles help protect NA as a whole when applied in our group affairs. While autonomy gives us certain freedoms, it also implies responsibility for our actions and for the continued well-being of NA. As groups, we exercise our responsibility to the fellowship by taking inventory of our behavior and how we hold meetings. 
Our group exercises its autonomy in a responsible way when it takes care to consider the common welfare of the fellowship as a whole before it acts. Open-mindedness is essential if we are to use autonomy to help not grow. With an open-minded attitude, we are more receptive to new ways of reaching addicts. We learn to find and fill our niche in the not community. We encourage each member of the group to contribute thoughts and ideas. Our attitude of open-mindedness helps us remember that each group is part of a greater whole. Acknowledging that we are part of something bigger than ourselves prompts us to look at still more new ideas. Our diversity can enrich us only when we are open to its richness. Remembering our part in the greater whole, we consider unity when we think about applying the fourth tradition. Any decision that we make as an autonomous group ought to be founded first in our common welfare. Although we are autonomous, we may offer loving support to other groups by attending their meetings or offering other help. Now meetings thrive when groups look beyond their immediate needs to offer help to each other. Love is the principle that guides us to see Na as a greater whole. This impacts our responsibility as autonomous groups. Our group's autonomous decisions, based on our love for Na, will serve to strengthen our efforts to serve others. Love encourages us to reach out to other members and other groups, finding ways to cooperate with them in carrying the message of recovery. Anonymity applied to the fourth tradition reminds us that each group has an equal place in the fellowship of Na. Larger groups are not more important than smaller groups. Older groups are not better than newer groups. While all groups have the freedom to apply principles in whatever ways seem best to them, those same principles make each group an equal partner in recovery. Each group bears an equal responsibility in the work and in the reputation of NA. Autonomy in NA gives groups the freedom to act on their own to establish an atmosphere of recovery serve their members, and fulfill our primary purpose. The responsibility that balances our autonomy reflects the principles expressed in the first three traditions. Preserving the unity of the Na Fellowship comes first. Next, we seek direct ion from a loving higher power. Then, we hold meetings that welcome everyone with a desire to stop using. Healthy, vital groups are essential to the growth of Narcotics Anonymous. Groups provide a place where we can offer our most basic service, one addict reaching out to another with the message of recovery. Without our autonomous group, we would be unable to fulfill our primary purpose. Tradition 5. 71. Each group has but one primary purpose to carry the message to the addict who still suffers. Our primary purpose is at the heart of our service. With guidance from a loving higher power and a clear focus on this purpose, NA groups become a channel for the healing power of recovery. Narcotics Anonymous exists to help addicts find freedom from active addiction. If we were to espouse other ideas or pursue other goals, our focus would be blurred and our energies diminish. The fifth tradition asks us to practice integrity by keeping our purpose foremost. Tradition 5 helps our groups fulfill the fundamental reason for their existence, to carry the message to the addict who still suffers. As we learned in the fourth tradition, NA groups are free to find new and different ways of presenting meetings. This freedom is important, it protects and encourages diversity, letting us reach addicts by many means.
In this autonomy, each group develops a character of its own. The character of the group is not its purpose, however. The message we carry is not our group personality but the message of Narcotics Anonymous the principles of recovery. What is the message that we are asked to carry? Groups carry the message of Na, hope and freedom from active addiction. This message may be voiced in many ways. Sometimes we simply share that if we don't use any drugs, we won't get loaded. Other members share that they have found satisfying, productive lives in recovery. Sometimes the message we share is that, even though life may be painful, we can stay clean. The spiritual awakening we experience when we work the steps is also our message. When addicts experience the message of recovery, we find healing from our suffering, no matter what the cause. We can live drug-free and establish new lives. That is our message. That an addict, any addict, can stop using drugs, lose the desire to use, and find a new way to live. The group's focus on carrying the message is so important to the survival of Na that it is called our primary purpose. That means it is the most important thing we do. Nothing ought to take precedence over it. This is the most basic guideline by which groups may examine their motives and their actions. There are many ways in which groups can further our primary purpose. Generally speaking, group members start by creating an atmosphere of recovery in their meetings. This includes extending a welcome to every addict who attends. Stable meetings that start on time carry a message of recovery. Effective meeting formats keep the primary purpose in focus and encourage members to participate in a way that expresses recovery. We lead by example, sharing experience instead of advice. Group members help further our purpose when they take personal responsibility for keeping the meeting recovery oriented. All of our actions convey a message, and Tradition 5 reminds us to make it a message of recovery. There are many distracting influences that can divert us from our primary purpose. For instance, our groups may be tempted to use meeting time to discuss their business and finances or talk about some controversy. As individual members, we can get caught up in socializing with our friends, ignoring another addict who may be in pain and needs our encouragement. But each time our focus is diverted from our primary purpose, the addict seeking recovery loses out. Other influences can distort our group's focus on its primary purpose. From the money members contribute, our groups pay rent on their meeting space, buy literature and supplies, conduct activities, and support NA services. All of these can either help further our primary purpose or 72. Distract us from our focus. Some groups seek to outdo others with luxurious meeting spaces, extravagant refreshments, huge supplies of literature, and elaborate activities. When we do this, our focus is distracted away from our primary purpose and onto money, property, and prestige. We should try to establish a reputation for carrying the message nothing more, nothing less. Money, literature, and meeting space are tools we can use to help us carry the message. However, they should serve us, not rule us. The groups can provide many services to carry the message. Our primary service is the NA meeting, where addicts share their recovery directly with one another. Additional services like phone lines, public information work, and H&I panels also help carry the message. 
In rural areas and newer not communities, roofs are sometimes the only source of such services. However, most groups find they cannot maintain their focus on their recovery meetings and also carry out other services. For this reason, groups usually assign responsibility for such services to their area committees. That way, groups reserve their time and energy for carrying the message directly to the addict who still suffers. Because carrying the message is so important, many groups take inventory periodically to help ensure that our primary purpose is still in focus. The 12 traditions may be used as an outline for a group inventory. Some groups use a specific set of inventory questions, such as, how well are we carrying the message of recovery? Are there addicts our group isn't reaching? How can we make our meetings more accessible? What can we do to make new members feel more at home? Has the atmosphere of recovery diminished? Would a change in our meeting format strengthen that atmosphere? Considering the needs of the larger not community may lead to other changes. For instance, if there are no step meetings in one town, a group may consider having meetings that focus on the steps. There are many ways to carry the message and meet the needs of both the group and the not community. There is a power that works through this program. We tap this power when we practice the 12th step as individuals, carrying the message to other addicts. When groups carry the message, the impact of the 12th step is greatly multiplied. Even more impressive than sheer numbers of recovering addicts is the unity of purpose and the atmosphere of recovery found in meetings of spiritual power. The evidence of that power in the group is hard to deny. It is a power we can draw on between meetings to stay clean. Tradition 5 focuses the group's priority on carrying the message. Members can do many things to further our primary purpose. For example, we show our care and our willingness to help by taking turns greeting people at the door, preparing lists of telephone numbers to distribute, or offering packets of literature to newcomers. When members come together as a group to undertake the task of carrying the message, they offer an attractive picture of recovery in action. Many meetings are structured to carry the message to our newest members. These new members often need more encouragement to stay, more answers to their questions, more of our love and care. But the newest members are not the only addicts who need the message of recovery. The still suffering addict with whom we share our hope may be any one of us, regardless of screen time. Tradition 5 is not limited to helping newcomers. The message of recovery is for all of us. Applying spiritual principles. 73. The fifth tradition complements the twelfth step. It asks groups to carry the message to addicts. As individuals, we are asked in the steps to apply principles in all our affairs. This is also important in our actions as groups. Some of the principles we have applied to help us observe the fifth tradition include integrity, responsibility, unity, and anonymity. Integrity, our fidelity to the principles embodied in the 12 traditions, is demonstrated when groups carry the non-message of recovery. Many of our members have much to offer on a variety of subjects, but our fellowship has its own special message. Freedom from active addiction through practice of NAS 12 steps and the support of the fellowship of recovering addicts. Groups demonstrate this when they offer vigorous, conscious support for addicts seeking to work the NAW program. 
When groups conscientiously cultivate this kind of integrity, their meetings further our primary purpose. The fifth tradition gives our groups a great responsibility to maintain our fellowship's primary purpose. Each group is responsible to become as effective a vehicle for carrying the Na message as 